Oh, thanks, John. You set me up nicely for some stuff. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Erica Feiler. I'm here on behalf of the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about the bacterial endotoxin specification. All right, a couple of learning objectives for us today. So what are endotoxins and why are they a patient risk? How do you control endotoxins in injectable drug products? And how do you go about setting the acceptance criteria for the endotoxin specification? Let's, let's jump in. All right, so why am I here? And don't worry, this isn't a meaning of life question, but rather why has SBIA dedicated a session at this conference for me to talk to you about endotoxins? Well, first of all, the people in my group are the people who are scrutinizing the endotoxin specification found in your ANDAs. It's something that we scrutinize very closely because we know that too high a level of endotoxins in the drug product presents patient risk. And finally, we get a lot of ANDAs with the endotoxin specification set too high. And so this necessitates us to send information requests. We may have to ask an applicant to change a specification. They may need to do new method suitability studies. You know, stuff that we want to try to avoid during the assessment cycle. We also get a lot of questions about the endotoxin specification through our control correspondence program. So, you know, taken all together, this is an aspect for which there is patient risk and there seems to be a lot of confusion on the topic. So I'm here today to tell you how we approach looking at that endotoxins acceptance criteria to try and help you get that specification set right the first time when you submit your ANDA. Okay, so what are endotoxins? Now, endotoxins, they're just a normal component of the cell wall of gram-negative microorganisms. Now, you see I've got a little cartoon here on the slide, and the cartoon is a cross-section of a gram-negative microorganism, and you see those little, those little hairs there on the top of it, those little red molecules labeled lipopolysaccharide. It's just another name for endotoxin. Now, these molecules can actually have a very dramatic reaction with the human immune system. So the reaction they can have can lead to outcomes such as fever, shock, and if you're exposed to too many, even death. And so, you know, this is something that we want to scrutinize very closely. Now, this is not a theoretical concern. There have been noted instances of endotoxin reactions to injectable products, including one notable occurrence involving gentamicin in the late 1990s. So, you know, this is something that we at FDA and you in the parenteral drug industry are keeping a very close eye on because we want to prevent that type of adverse patient outcomes from our drugs. Okay. So, Microorganisms are ubiquitous in the environment. That's a fact. So how do we go about controlling the presence of endotoxins in our drug products? Now, I bet some of you are thinking, well, Erica, come on now, the drugs are sterilized, right? And that's gonna get rid of the microorganisms. That's correct. Sterilization gets rid of live microorganisms, but Endotoxins, they're kind of the remains. They're kind of what's left over also from killed microorganisms. So all the microorganisms that the product is exposed to along the manufacturing path, they can have an additive effect on the endotoxin burden. And as it turns out, most common sterilization methods do nothing to inactivate the endotoxin molecule. So sterilization isn't going to help us here. So what can we do to reduce the risk of endotoxins in the drug products? Well, this is an aspect of manufacturing for which we have to take a quality by design approach, right? So for the typical quality by design approach for small molecules to keep uh, endotoxins at safe levels, it's gonna involve activities like 
choosing the correct grade of API and excipients for the drug product. Going to want to keep good bio burden control, particularly at the formulation stage. And I know John talked about that just a little bit in his presentation. We're going to want to be sure to depyrogenate our container closure system, get rid of the endotoxins where we can. And finally, the cornerstone of any good mitigation strategy is going to be some in product testing. Now, I've highlighted release and stability testing here on this slide. And why did I highlight that? Because that's where we see most of our issues in our applications. So let's take a closer look at that specification for endotoxins for our drug products. So we know that a specification consists of a test, a method, and an acceptance criteria. Let's break it down as it relates to endotoxins. So obviously our test is gonna be for endotoxins. The method that we most commonly see for ANDAs, for endotoxins testing, is found in the United States Pharmacopeia's chapter 85. Um, now this is also a harmonized chapter, so you're gonna see this in the European and the Japanese Pharmacopeia as well. And within the chapter, there are a number of different methods that you can choose from to perform your endotoxins testing. So we got our test, we got our method, our acceptance criteria. Now the acceptance criteria for endotoxins, that can also be found in USP 85 as well. Let's take a closer look at that. Okay, that's it. That is the acceptance criteria for endotoxins and sterile injectable drug products. It makes you do a little work, doesn't it? It makes you do a little bit of math, but it's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. So to get the endotoxins acceptance criteria for your drug product, you have to divide the variable K, which represents the threshold pyrogenic dose of endotoxin per kilogram body weight, and you have to divide that by the variable M, which is the maximum recommended bolus dose of product per kilogram body weight. Okay, I mean, it asks you to do a little math, but it's not that much, and it only asks you for two variables. So I guess the only question remaining for this is gonna be, what are K and M? Okay, so here at this conference, I am here today to tell you the secret to finding K. It's really hard to find, actually. Um, so on the screen, I've got a snapshot of the last page of USP Chapter 85. It's small, but I'm just trying to show you a location. Um, about midway down the page, where I've got a blue box outlined in really teeny tiny font, that's where you'll find all the values that you're gonna need for K. So now you know the secret, because you attended this conference, you know the secret to finding K. I did transcribe some of the values here on my slides so we could take a bit of a closer look at them. First, I'm gonna introduce a unit, the endotoxin unit. Um, that is just a measure of the biological reactivity of the endotoxin, and you'll see K expressed in endotoxin units per kilogram. But the other thing that we notice about K is that we've got a lot of different values for it, right? So there's a K for intrathecal injections. There's a K for injections by all other routes of administration. There is a K for products dosed based on body surface area, and we see a lot of our oncology products dosed in that way. Um, there are also a couple of other Ks for radiopharmaceutical products that I didn't list here, but again, I've highlighted something on the slide, and that is the 5 EU per kilogram K. Um, we're gonna do some math here in a minute. Don't, don't act too excited. We're gonna do a couple of calculations here in a minute. So you're gonna see that five EU per kilogram again. So I want you to remember that. Now M, M is much more intuitive, right? It's just the maximum dose of your product. That's pretty straightforward. But what I want to caution you when we're talking about M is that you need to take the value of M from your product label. Now, 
John mentioned this earlier in his talk as well. You cannot guess M. You cannot take M from a monograph. You need to take M from the product label. Um, one other thing that we don't see as much, but I wanted to add it on the slide, that is if you've got a kit, so a product that's co-packaged, maybe product and diluent packaged together, the, contrib the endotoxin contributions of both of those should be considered as one, but we don't see that too terribly often. All right, so you see that both K and M have aspects of body weight. So what weight are we talking about here? For endotoxin calculations, OPMA considers the standard adult body weight to be 70 kilograms. But we know that there are products that have indications for a pediatric population as well. And those need to be considered when you're setting that acceptance criteria. So to find the appropriate pediatric body weight for your patient population, we recommend referring to the Center for Disease Control's weight for age charts. And I'm going to show you how, to, how we approach that in one of my case studies here. Now, if you're setting a specification and you feel like you're doing a lot of legwork, a lot of calculations, had to figure out you know, my M for this population, all this stuff, there is a place in the submission where you can explain your thinking, you can explain your rationale, and that's in section 32P56. It's a great place to discuss the rationale for your K and for your M. Okay, case study time. Time for me to do math on stage. Everybody ready for that? Yeah, I, I had somebody check my math beforehand, so I had a, I had a, a reviewer actually check my math beforehand. Um, all right, we're gonna do one simple and one complex case study. So we'll start out with the simple. The product for our simple case study is called luprolide acetate. It is a product for the treatment of prostate cancer. It's got a very simple dosage information on its label. And this is pretty much all it says. The recommended dose is one milligram administered as a single daily subcutaneous injection. There's not much there, but we've already got enough information to figure out how we start to set up the problem for our acceptance criteria. So this is a subcutaneous injection not intrathecal, so we know what our K is going to be. There are no pediatric indications listed on this label. And finally, this is just a vial of drug product, no kit to have to worry about. So we go back and stare down our acceptance criteria calculation that we have to do. But hey, we have all the information that we need. We take our 5 EU per kilogram K, we know our dose and our adult body weight. And so after that, it's just a matter of doing a little bit of arithmetic and canceling out the units to get an endotoxins acceptance criteria of 350 EU per milligram. Easy peasy. Okay, now let's turn it up a little bit, make it a little bit harder. The, pro the product for our complex case study is a product called Leviteracetam. And this is an anti-epileptic, present in a lot of different formats, tablets, but there is also an intravenous injectable format. Okay, that already tells us something. We already know that our K here, because it's an intravenous injection, is gonna be five EU per kilogram. Ooh, but look at that dosing information. That is a mouthful. Um, we've got pediatric dosing. We've got lots of different ages, lots of different doses. Well, okay, so we're going to have to we're going to look more closely at this. Now, obviously, I've worked this example for us, and I'm not going to go through this line by line. But hey, I think we should take a look at this one as maybe being our maximum dose for the drug product. We've got patients 12 years or older with a dose of up to 1,500 milligrams. All right, so we're going to turn to our CDC weight for age charts, 1,500 milligrams in a 12-year-old patient. So 
These charts separate male and female, and they also do the age by month. So what we're looking for here is we're gonna look for a 144 month old female. Why female? the weight is lower, so it gives us a worst case for the dose. We also recommend using the 50th percentile weight for this calculation. So what we end up with here is a 41.8 kilogram patient. Do our math, 36 milligram per kilogram. We're thinking that that is our worst case dose. So I go back to the label. Just double check, yes, 36 milligrams per kilogram is our worst case dose, and now we have our M. We had to work for that M, but now we have it. Plug in our values, do our arithmetic, cancel our units, and we end up with an endotoxins acceptance criteria of 0 0.14 EU per milligram. All right, a couple of resources for your perusal. Um, USP 85, I talked about that the entire time, really. But one thing I want you to know is that there is one type of injectable product that doesn't have its K in um, 85, and that is ophthalmic injections. You're going to find that information in USP 771. Um, got our CDC weight for age charts. But honestly, you could just Google CDC weight for age charts and that information will come right up. There's the URL if you need it. Um, a great guidance on endotoxins testing and a guidance on our controlled correspondence program where again, we do get a lot of questions about that endotoxin specification. Okay, recap. Exposure to excessive endotoxins is a patient risk. Process design and in-product testing are both important things that work together to ensure that endotoxins are controlled in your drug product. USP Chapter 85 contains information regarding both methods and acceptance criteria for endotoxins testing. And when you are setting that acceptance criteria, you should be taking your information from the product label. Okay, time for our quiz, and then we'll wrap up for the day, and I'll turn it over to our next speakers. Okay, now you're all very clever, I know, so I know you're going to get this. The acceptance criterion for the endotoxin specification for a subcutaneous injection should be calculated from the formula provided in USP 85. I don't hear anybody. That's true, as I said, you guys are all very clever. Excellent job. Next one is much less wordy, okay. Um, K, K is the same for all injectable drug products. True or false? False, oh, you guys are great, excellent. All right, well that is the end of my time and my material today, so thank you for your kind attention